Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. My name is Savannah Bucciarelli, and I'm a 15-year-old English-Italian student who attends this American School of Milan here in, in Milan. <laughs> Um, if someone would have told me to eat crickets a few years ago, I would have turned away in disgust. Just the thought of eating any type of insect used to be completely foreign to me. However, now it might be something that we have to get used to. In our ever-changing world, we are seeing the rise of non-traditional foods, which are now becoming the norm. As a generation who uses social media on an everyday basis, we have seen foods such as avocados and blueberries emerge, and the world is only trying to keep up. Rabobank has stated that in, um, in the past year, trade in avocados has increased by 12%, and such foods with a focus on nutrition and health have become more prevalent in our lifestyles. Um, different dietary lifestyles such as vegetarianism and gluten-free diets are becoming more and more popular. For example, veganism has increased by 350% from the year 2006 to the year 2016 in the UK. In 20 years' time, we will be eating more alternative foods that will be benefiting both our health and our environment. Last year, I tried my first cricket with my friends, and though I'm not used to the idea yet, I can say that it doesn't shock me anymore. I'm, sh I'm very excited to hear about what these people have uh, towards pioneering new food products, and I'm sure you are too. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. I had to eat crickets too, which they, you know, they, they're not too bad. Anyway, I'm so excited to be here at my first Seeds and Chips conference. For those who don't know me, my name is Jade Scipioni, and I'm a reporter for Fox Business. And my job is to report on all the work that you guys are doing. Every startup in the food and wellness sector I've reported on, and it's so exciting to see how you guys are nipping at the heels of big food. You are really forcing them to change after being stale for so many years. And while we are making big waves, there's still so much work that needs to be done. Obesity levels are higher than ever before, and new diseases are popping up all the time. We need to change the mindsets of people around the world to, change, to, to, to think about everything they put in their mouth has a direct effect on our environment. So I think the conversation now turns into how do we, ch how do we take what you guys are doing and move it from a niche, for a niche audience to the bigger, broader audience and really ch change the mindset. And one of those people I'm about to introduce is we're talking about the clean meat movement, and it's Seth Goldman, and he has really transformed the way we've eaten meat, um, and it's breaking down walls. So I'd like to introduce him next. <laughs> Thank you, Jade. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm really excited to share with you what we're doing at Beyond Meat. Um, and I want to also share another company that I work with called Honest Tea. It's a company I uh, started 20 years ago. And <clears throat> Honest Tea and Beyond Meat are really emblematic of a huge um, phenomenon that's happening in food, which is food is moving in two different directions. And I'm going to call it the undoing and the redoing of food. So what does it mean? Undoing is when you move towards simplification, authentic, uh, transparent supply chains, simple ingredients, and a, a very clean ingredient panel. The redoing of food, which I'll talk about with respect to Beyond Meat, is when you use science and innovation to recreate a category. But let me first talk a little bit about uh, the undoing of food with Honest Tea. So I started Honest Tea 20 years ago. In fact, I'm delighted that my 20-year-old son, Isaac, is in the audience here. It, he and Honest Tea are twins. Uh, and at the time, <laughs> we started the company with the idea that just we were thir I was thirsty. You know, I went to the beverage cooler, and everything was so sweet. And I said, how come there isn't anyone making tea with one or two teaspoons of sugar? Uh, and that started there, and then we launched it. I got five thermoses of tea that I sold to the buyer at the Whole Foods in the D.C. area. Um, I said, I want to sell this in your stores. I got an empty bottle that I pasted a label on. And the buyer said, all right, well, we'll give it a try. And he ordered 15,000 bottles. 
which was a terrifying moment because we'd never made it anywhere but our kitchen. But we managed to get into Whole Foods and just through sampling and um, really <coughs> trying to encourage people to try the product, we became the best-selling tea in the 17 Whole Foods stores um, by the end of the summer of 1998. And then we continued to grow and innovate and we also were the first to launch organic bottled tea and the first to launch fair trade certified bottled tea and we became the best-selling organic uh, bottled tea company, and then shortly the best-selling organic kids drink as well. Uh, we were acquired by Coca-Cola in 2011, and one of the reasons uh, I'm in uh, Europe this month is because starting really this week, we are launching Honest Tea all across um, Europe. The, the mission statement of the brand you see, promoting health and wellness, reducing our environmental footprint, creating economic opportunity through fair trade, and of course, uh, maintaining transparency and building community. But what's exciting is that we are now launching Honest Tea um, across Europe. You can see the different countries and the different innovations. You know, as I said, it started with tea, but we also have now a kid's product. We're launching an Honest Coffee, which of course would be organic, lower calorie, and fair trade certified uh, coffee drinks as well. So lots of opportunity and excitement and, and clearly um, a receptiveness to this idea of undoing food. So that's what happened when I got thirsty. But about, uh, about six years ago, I got hungry. <laughs> and I, uh, my family has been vegetarian for 13 years, and we have consistently been dissatisfied with the taste of veggie burgers. In fact, I, I've said before that if the meat industry had a conspiracy to try to discourage people from becoming vegetarian, the veggie burger would be the perfect strategy because you try it once, and you say, I really don't need to be a vegetarian that badly. So you get the loyal and devout followers of vegetarianism who are willing to make the sacrifice and go to the freezer where they can buy their products. But I could think, I was trying to think of a great way to illustrate the negative reaction people have to vegan and plant-based foods. And I found this slide. This is, um, so in the United States, or last year, there was a, a terrible hurricane in Houston. People were desperate for food and the shelves were cleaned out, except for one section, which is the plant-based protein section. And there could be no more stinging indictment of the failure of this category to meet demand. And we said, well, wait a minute. And I knew if I'm hungry, my family's hungry, and people in Houston have that kind of reaction, there's an opportunity here. And it just so happens that as I was going through this thought process, my wife was reading an article about a company getting started on the West Coast called Beyond Meat, which was seeking to perfectly replicate the taste and texture of meat using plants. And I literally emailed to info at beyondmeat.com, and I said, I hear what you're doing. I'd love to help. I have some experience that might be useful and uh, got involved as a board member and then became executive chairman a few years ago. And what we do at Beyond Meat, just to help highlight the opportunity, let's just look at what's going on. So in the United States, the dairy category has been transformed. Dairy um, is now fully 14% of the dairy category is plant-based dairy, you know, almond milk, soy milk, and growing very quickly. But in the meat sector, a much larger category, a $200 billion category, the meat sector, the, the, the plant-based part of meat is just that thin little orange line. And the reason that it's so thin is because consumers have not adopted plant-based meat the way they've adopted plant-based dairy. It's our belief the reason for that is because the products are inferior. So at Beyond Meat, we said, let's start from the beginning. Let's redefine meat. And so we did an MRI of a hamburger, you know, a magnetic resonating Image, uh, imaging <laughs> to understand that at the very molecular level, what is a hamburger and how do we redefine it? And so we said, okay, well, you've got amino acids that form the proteins. Well, those occur in the plant kingdom as well. There's amino acids in plants. We can find a lot of the same amino acids in peas that, are, that occur in meat. And then we said, well, there's fats, so the lipids that are in meat. Well, those occur in, in coconut oil and canola oil as well. Water, the product 70% water, of course, that occurs without an animal. And then the rest is trace minerals and carbohydrates. So we're not, it's not that there's some magical ingredient in meat we can't find and source in the plant kingdom. What's, what's unique about meat is the way that it's structured. And so we developed a, an ability to combine the fats and the proteins and water using heat and cooling and pressure to stitch together the fats to the proteins in a way that when they're heated, they retain the moisture and juiciness and flavor 
that meat retains. And as you know, most veggie burgers, when you cook them, they dry out or they crumble. And our burger still has the same sizzle. It comes out looking like this. And that tastes as good as it looks. Uh, and all of a sudden, we have found that when you can make a product that close to meat, consumers respond in a very different way. Just to give you the fundamentals of the nutritional, so it's got basically about the same amount of protein as a, as a burger. Uh, it's got a, a little more iron. It has about half the saturated fat of burger, zero cholesterol, and about the same amount of calories. But what you've got, of course, when you think about the other uh, aspects of this is a much lighter environmental footprint, right? The cow is a notoriously inefficient converter of plants to protein, right? A cow takes nine months to take plants and make them into protein. All the water, all the feed, all the waste associated with that. Um, and we basically take the plants and convert them into protein, skipping so many of the other, <laughs> skipping, not the middleman, skipping the middle cow. Um, what's notable about the Beyond Burger is that we have chosen to work with retailers to merchandise a product not in the freezer section, but to merchandise them in the meat section. And our belief is that we will transform the meat section into the protein section. So it's no longer just hamburger, chicken, you know, chicken breast. It's cow protein, chicken protein, and plant protein. And the results have been phenomenal. We have launched this now in the two largest retailers in the United States. In several regions, the Beyond Burger is the top selling packaged burger in the meat section. Not the top selling plant-based burger in the meat section, the top selling packaged burger in the meat section. And that's transformational. That um, starts to transform the way consumers behave. I want to um, bring this, uh, we've also launched it at TJI Fridays uh, nationally. And what I'm excited to announce today is that starting this summer, starting in July, the Beyond Burger will be launching distribution throughout Europe. That's an applause line, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> We're delighted to have our distributor here. Willem, if you just want to raise your hand, anybody who wants to order the Beyond Burger, uh, that's the man to go to. It's a big step for us. It's something we've been working on a long time. We know this market is very receptive to it. We've certainly, from the e emails and, in and um, social inquiries, we've sent a ton of excitement about this product. So we're excited to bring it. I want to just give you a closing thought, and then we'll, we'll bring on the next speaker. But um, we've got Beyond Sausage. That's launched in the United States. That won't make it here until next year, but it's phenomenal. Um, Tale of Two Henry. So when we think about change, there's two different ways to think about it. You know, the activist and then the, the business. Henry Berg was an activist who tried to change the way animals were treated in the United States. And he lobbied for laws, and he got a lot of laws passed. But there was a different Henry who also changed the way animals were treated, Henry Ford. By commercializing the combustion engine, he literally transferred the term horsepower from the horse to the car, the tractor. And if you ask a horse who did more to help your quality of life, the horse might say, well, Henry Berg had his heart in the right place, but Henry Berg transformed the way I live. And from our point of view, we are partners and proud to be partners with entities that promote animal rights. Uh, but we know the real way to protect animals is if we can transform the diet um, and by pro providing just a great tasting burger, there'll be a ton of transformation to follow. My last thought for you is that of course, the, the benefits here. Um, I'll just share with you a quote. If we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. Obviously, it's my view, we need to change the direction we are going. And it's especially striking when you look at the United States. So every five years, the UN ranks the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries. I was really surprised by these numbers. So the first, you know, even though the United States is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, with more knowledge of science and medicine and nutrition than any civilization in history, when the rankings came out in 2015, you had Japan as number one. Number two was Italy, which I was very impressed by, especially after I see how many people are smoking. I couldn't believe it, but I, I still <laughs> tip my hat to you. But number 42 was the United States. And to me, that is a shame because we have, a, we have so much potential as a country, and to see us not live up to our potential is, 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 is not right. But it's also an incredible business opportunity. If we can help people live healthier, longer, higher quality lives, that's an amazing opportunity. But I will say it's not easy to do. I, and you'll be hearing from other entrepreneurs today who are also hard at work. And you can talk about how difficult it is and all the barriers. That's easy to do. But I have a, uh, I'll share in closing this quote from those who say it can not be done should not interrupt the people doing it. I'm proud to be one of them and I know you'll look, uh, enjoy hearing from the rest of them. Thank you very much.
Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Dan Alshuler, and I am a venture partner at New Crop Capital. We are an investment fund that focuses exclusively on companies such as Beyond Meat. Innovation in plant-based food products is not limited to high-tech solutions. We just heard the great story of Ethan and Seth and everything that they're doing with Beyond Meat, and it is amazing. We are big fans, we are investors, and we like what they're doing. But we also recognize that not everybody has the access to the science or the funding, but still there are other paths to innovation by leveraging culinary techniques, and that's what I want to talk with you about today. A little background on New Crop Capital. We are an early stage fund uh, focused with a particular mission. We believe that the traditional animal agriculture industry is broken. We think it's a system that is not good for us, it's not good for the environment, and it's not good for the animals. And we think it can be done better. So what we are doing is we are investing in companies developing alternatives using plant-based and cultured meat technologies to bring to market the type of products that consumers are clamoring for. In the two years since New Crop has started, we've made over 25 investments across the world in companies such as Beyond Meat, Memphis Meats, Miyoko's Kitchen, and Alpha Foods, just to name a few. Now, Seth already touched on the potential of plant-based meats. Uh, estimates right now are that in the next 30 years, the, the sales could reach over $300 billion a year. This is a huge opportunity with a lot of benefits for everybody involved. Just in the US alone, all alternative to animal proteins already represent over $3 billion in sales. And that's an 8% growth from last year alone. What is interesting is who is purchasing these types of products and why they are purchasing. More than 20% of Americans already recognize that they want to eat less animal proteins. And millennials are the ones who are actually leading the drive. 30% of them are already eating a substitute, a meat alternative, at least once a day. 50% a couple of times a week. Most interesting, only 5% of millennials consider themselves vegans or vegetarians. So this is no longer a niche. It's becoming a mass movement. Now, here I wanted to show you some of the players in the space. You'll note the ones with our logo are companies that we have invested in. In this matrix, I've just put together some companies based on their level of technology and the texture as it compares to a traditional animal product. And if you notice, there is a white space here. As a venture capitalist, we believe this is what we're looking for, an opportunity in the market where a company can come in and make their mark. And today I want to talk about three companies that we believe are doing great things in this space. All of these companies are using what is called biomimicry. It is a design of production materials, structures, and systems that are modeled on biological entities and processes. Basically, these companies are looking at nature for inspiration. Biomimicry bio brands are brands that are driven by a chef. They are able to start small. Their offerings are usually beautiful. It is more of an art. And they differentiate themselves through unique uh, tricks of the trade. None of them, or most of them, do not have any unique IPs, and it's just about the way that they go about doing things. As an investor, what I like about investing in biomimicry brands is that they are quick to market. They do not require a large investment in capital expenditures, and they have a potential to be global brands with less than $10 million in many cases. And then, in terms of a return on investment, there is a strong potential compared to food tech and agricultural companies, especially when we're considering later stage dilutions. So these are the three companies I want to talk about today. The first company is called Ocean Hugger Foods. This company was started by a chef after he spent some time in Japan uh, learning to do sushi. And he thought, can I make sushi out of tomatoes? They actually s have a lot of similar properties. And this is what he came up with. He has replicated the taste, the texture, and the look of raw tuna using five ingredients. And if you taste it, it's delicious. Tomatoes, water, soy, sugar, and sesame oil is all there is. The second company that's just starting out is called the Abbott's Butcher. They are using clean labeled ingredients to develop things such as plant-based chorizos or meatballs. 
And from, as you can see from their ingredient list, it's all non-processed uh, products. And the third company that I wanted to show you is called Wicked Healthy. This is a company started by the Sarnos brothers, who are two chefs who are vegan and believe in developing alternatives that are good for you and good for the environment. And this is an example of a mushroom steak and of pulled pork. To the eye, it's identical from an animal protein and the taste is just the same. And just to finish off, I'd like to point out that in summary, the plant-based category is booming and I recommend entrepreneurs to consider it. There are many types of opportunities and you do not need high technology or large amounts of investments to make it happen. What you do need is a chef because taste is the most important factor of all. Thank you very much. Before I start, can I ask a question? Where do most people on our planet live? As we know, the most populous nations are China and India, so it's no surprise that Asia is home to over half of humanity. For generations, many populations there have lived on uh, largely plant-centric diets supplemented with fish and some meats. In the last 30 to 40 years, however, we've seen the start of a dramatic shift in food consumption, but more importantly, food aspiration that should be of interest and concern to every single person in this room and at this conference. This increased adoption of a Western diet heavy in animal protein and fats is being driven by various factors, most notably the perception of meat as emblematic of, of wealth. Meat consumption in the Asia Pacific is esti estimated to rise 80% between 2014 and 2022. Now factor in the billions more people we will be joined by in decades following who will demand billions more kilograms of meat weekly. I think sometimes we forget the severity of, of this challenge, even those of us who work in food, because the reality is that if you're not terrified by this situation, you're probably not aware of what's going on. We're rapidly running out of planet trashing the joint and making ourselves sick. And the greatest cause is this runaway, out-of-control system of industrialised farming and fishing that isn't capable of meeting our protein demands today, let alone in 30 years. Our opportunity to reset this pathway is now. The answer? We must champion more sophisticated alternatives that render industrial animal agriculture obsolete. Why have I come to this uh, somewhat bold conclusion? When I was a naive 13-year-old uh, growing up in Melbourne, Australia, I started uh, or became an online, uh, sorry, I became an overnight activist after starting an online conservation campaign, which went global. I then embarked on a journey that took me to five continents, helping lead initiatives to drive system-based change and address issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, animal suffering, and extreme poverty. Over this time, there were three things that became very apparent to me. One, that our production and consumption of animals at current scale is fueling every one of the issues that I had worked on and more. Many people here will be familiar with the stats, but I just want to recap. Livestock production emits more pollution than the transport sector, is the leading cause of global deforestation and species loss, is a leading cause of marine po pollution and coastal dead zones. 35% of the world's grain harvest is fed to livestock, making food less accessible to those in poverty. It promotes infectious disease epidemics and antibiotic-resistant bugs due to overcrowding and overuse of uh, pharmaceuticals. And the consumption of the final product is helping lead uh, fuel leading chronic diseases in many parts of the world. Secondly, I realised that from a resource efficiency standpoint alone, this system does not make sense. On average, you put in six kilograms of plant material, eight and a half thousand litres of water, and in many cases, some form of drugs, and what do you get out? 
a single kilogram of meat plus a bunch of stuff we don't want. Cholesterol and fats that can over time do damage to our bodies. On average, 14 and a half kilograms of greenhouse gases, 80 kilograms of excrement and harmful pathogens and potentially drug-resistant bacteria. Filtering plants and water through an animal to get meat is like refueling your car by opening the flap and throwing a bucket of fuel at it. You lose far more than you gain, risk dangerous consequences, and end up creating a big fat mess. Finally, I had learned that to achieve systemic change on most issues, a shift in behavior is often required, and that's difficult. So you must meet stakeholders where they are at by offering a better choice that's easy. In this instance, as we've heard, innovations like plant-based meat, meat products made from plants, and clean meat, animal meat grown from cells, are the highest impact tools we have. For industry and government, it means less resources for greater outputs at lower cost once scaled and with a fraction of the risk and negative externalities. For consumers, it means tasty, culturally relevant and familiar food without the same adverse negative impacts on their health and the health of the world around them. These options respect the complex social, cultural and economic factors underpinning consumer choice and aspiration, which is particularly relevant for populations in Asia. And Asia presents the greatest need and opportunity for a rapid shift in protein supply. Now, I'm not from Asia, I'm from Australia. So where do I fit into this? Take a look at uh, this video. These people known as Daigos are shoppers who on behalf of their middle class clients in mainland China, clear shelves in Australia and New Zealand of particular food products and ship them to China. Their customers on the other end willingly pay a considerable premium for these goods, which range from uh, meat and seafood to baby formula and dairy. Why? Because they have a deep trust in the quality and safety of food from Australia and New Zealand. There were estimated to be up to 200,000 Daigo uh, in Australia alone as of 2017. Australia and New Zealand are food leaders in the Asia-Pacific. They export enough to only feed a fraction of Asia's population, however, they set the standards for food in the region. They're epicenters for quality food research, production and export, and food from both countries, as we can see, is highly renowned and sought after across Asia, with a reputation for being clean, green and quality. This is not the only reason that Australia and New Zealand present a highly strategic base for bringing new proteins into the region. There's both countries' close proximity and direct channels to Asia, our strong food industry infrastructure, world-class R&D capabilities, a secure commercial environment, and our government's commitment to supporting new innovation, particularly in food and agriculture. As my Prime Minister would say, Australia is moving from the mining boom to the dining boom. We have an untapped opportunity to harness this and create change not only domestically, but to influence the food agenda across the entire Asia Pacific, possibly the most critical food region in the world. Food Frontier exists to support leaders like you in embracing this opportunity. Food Frontier is a catalyzer. We're the middle body that works with, you know, connects and collaborates with stakeholders across the chain to grow the ecosystem for plant-based and clean meat in our region. We activate new research and development and commercialization of plant-based and clean meat, accelerate market supply and advocate for all stakeholders to embrace these cleaner, greener options. Here are some examples. We're mapping the R&D sector down under as it relates to uh, plant biology, regenerative medicine and food science and supporting the startup of the first local clean meat research in Melbourne, one of the world's hotspots for tissue engineering. We 
undertake research and de develop reports and strategies for companies like plant-based meat producers in the US to support their market entry and to use Australia and New Zealand as gateways and, and test markets for the broader Asia Pacific. And we're supporting retailers and restaurants to diversify their protein offerings. Like Woolworths, the largest grocery chain in Australia, whose senior team we presented to only weeks ago about the booming business for plant-based meats and how to effectively position these products to their customers. Together with our global partners like GFI, Food Frontier is meeting a critical need by connecting and bringing together innovators, investors and institutions to rapidly grow this movement for the future of our planet and its people. So, let's talk. If you're a philanthropist, I would love to scope opportunities for you to give impact at scale through carefully calibrated contributions. If you're an investor uh, looking for a high impact commercial opportunity, let's talk. If you're a researcher wondering where the edge is, let's talk. If you're an NGO or corporation interested in collaboration, let's talk. Changing the world is a team sport, and I look forward to exploring how together we can advance one of the highest impact opportunities to do exactly that. Thank you. Today, the world has a population of 7.3 billion. In 2050, that figure will rise to 9 billion and we will need the equivalent of three planets to meet our food and energy needs. A century ago, our daily diet was 80% plant-based. Nowadays, 80% of our diet is based on animal products, and it takes 15,000 liters of water to produce just one kilo of beef. We need to take action to ensure better management of the planet's declining resources, reduce environmental degradation, and to find solutions for us all, starting now. Microorganisms that have existed for thousands of years. Superfoods eaten over the centuries by many civilizations. They occur naturally in aquatic environments. Microalgae are uniquely rich in natural nutrients, vitamins, essential amino acids, proteins, minerals, and the vast potential they offer in terms of nutritional benefits is opening up numerous opportunities for innovation in the food market. Algama aims to play an active role in nutritional transition by developing high-value added products that incorporate all the potential and benefits of microalgae. Algama has a strong focus on research with a dedicated laboratory team that selects strains of microalgae, develops ingredients, and devises unique manufacturing processes. And on product marketing, developing delicious and innovative food products that fully meet consumer and market expectations in close collaboration with researchers and gastronomy professionals. Algama's goal is to bring us all the benefits of microalgae in terms of an improved diet, functional and responsible nutrition, and pleasure in eating to ensure that all of us can enjoy better health. Algama, made from microalgae. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alvin. I'm the CEO at Algama. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, coming after these great speakers, I had to cheat with the video, so it was easier for me. And, um, and a good introduction to Algama. So now I can share a little bit of my experience as a new entrepreneur trying to do food products and making healthier choice, sustainable, more sustainable products. So I started a company five years ago when I was in Paris with two, two friends of mine, and we had this call in mind. We, we just thought, it's just too bad that we're facing a great challenge today. Microalgae can help us to bring solution to something that is huge. Well, the speakers before me told you a lot about the scarcity, about obesity, about malnutrition, about the, the, what we do to the environment, the oceans. And we, we just thought that it's, it's just crazy. And we can take action from now with a new ingredient. 
and that's why we want to introduce microalgae. Well, microalgae is basically like algae, but smaller, if I can make it simple like that. There's a lot of species of algae in the world. It's been here forever, and people say that it helps to, to bring life on Earth because it's the first photosynthetic organism in, in the world. And it, it, it's very crazy. It has a lot of protein, up to 70%, a lot of vitamins, a lot of minerals, and it's very sustainable to make. So from that, we decided to fi find out how, to, how we can come from this green powder here, or green biomass, to have a real product, real actual product. And we thought about the product that we wanted to have. And it's pretty simple. I'm a pretty simple guy, actually, when it comes to food. I, I'm a true food lover, and I'm basically looking for a very tasty product. That's the first thing. The second thing is I want to have something I can afford, obviously. I want to have something that I can find in the corner because I live in, big in, in a big city and I'm not going to well, go for mice and mice to, to find the food that I really like and that I really want. And that's basically what consumers want. And consumers also want to have products that they do understand. And understanding the product is also very related to the marketing and everything you will go around, but it's, it's very basic. When, when you have a bottle of water, you know that it's water, you know that it's not vodka in it because you can recognize the, the, the bottle. And it could be sweet, but from the bottle, you know that it's water, you can recognize it. Or you can recognize that it's water because it's, it's gonna be written large in the bottle, water. So you, you need to know what you're going to buy. And we thought about something else. We thought about the fact that that's the very basis, but also we think that consumers and people we want to, to change the game they're also looking for healthier products, more sustainable. They want to have an impact in the world. And you can have an impact doing like the people in here while investing themselves, the time, the money into companies, into, into projects that will change the world thanks to the product they're making. Or you can also change the world thanks to the product you're buying and the product you're eating every day. So that's the, that's the second thing that I consider extremely important. But for these things, Algama is making tasty, healthy and sustainable product. The healthy and sustainable part, we decided to, well, keep it kind of behind the curtain because we figured out that the consumer doesn't care that much. 95% of the people, they won't care about the fact that they will do something positive for the environment. They, they don't realize how important it's gonna be for their health to buy better products. So I, I, I consider this is our role to be able to bring new solutions, to bring new products, new ingredients, new ways to eat, but the consumer doesn't have to bother doing any effort. And I think that the guys before are doing too. When you consider the, the Beyond Burger, it's true that the other veggie burgers are pretty hard to eat. And, and when we try, you, you try the Beyond Burger, it's extremely similar, it's actually very tasty and you, and you like it. You can enjoy it even if you like meat. And that's the thing. That's the, I think that this, this very important thing is to consider that we can think about a niche market, but what we want to tackle is the, the, the mass market, the big thing. That's what I like about these companies. And, and it's very inspiring and we decided to do pretty much the same. And we, um, well, this is the Good Spoon, the first product that Algama is making. This is basically a vegan mayonnaise. We make a vegan mayonnaise thanks to the algae. Thanks to that, we took out the eggs. We took out half the fat, so it's very light, but it's super tasty. But it's no cholesterol, no GMO, no preservatives, no artificial colors, no artificial flavors, and whatever and whatever, and everything is super clean, and it's super tasty. So the consumer, what, what, what we want to show to the consumer is that, do you want to try this mayo? Do you like it? If you like it, you can buy it because it's extremely affordable. It's uh, the, the price of a mayo, a classic mayo, and this is the way to, well, tackle the market. Today, the niche, the niche market, I'll say, is pretty easy to reach. Vegan people are coming to us. The, the people who are looking for this kind of product, uh, for this kind of product, they, they will come anyway. But when I'm, very, I'm very glad to see that even people who want to eat meat, who want to eat classic mayo, and we have distribution in France and in the US, and in the US is particular because a lot of people are Hellman's guys, they want the Hellman's mayo, and they say, 
actually this one is very good. And when you tell me that it's healthier, I might go for it. And it's pretty much the same in a very traditional market like France. But we can do a lot with microalgae. That's another example of what we're doing. So spring wave is a beverage. A beverage we enhanced with spirulina, one kind of microalgae. Well, in, in the example before, we're using the ingredients to substitute the egg and the fat to make something cleaner, something more sustainable. In here, well, we do something else. We enhance, thanks to the extremely benefit, beneficial properties of microalgae. I showed you there's a lot of protein, a lot of vitamins. So we made an antioxidant beverage that is totally unique today and that we're going to launch on the market in the US pretty soon. We, we believe that we want to make food for everyone. Obviously, we, we, have, we have a startup. So we're starting small. We're starting with kind of a niche market, but with product that can reach the mass. But we also believe that we can do a lot, and we, can, we should do a lot more that, than this. Because this is very interesting. This is a product for the people in New York. This is a product for the people in Paris. But we're also very invested in bringing microalgae to the people in Africa. And we're fighting hunger thanks to the, our capacities, our expertise to make products, innovative products that people can use from the farm to the village. And this is something we already started. And it actually, it cost us almost nothing. It's uh, something that we do uh, on our very own time. And we can show that not only we have something that, said, that can satisfy people with money, but also with the people all over the world for the emerging countries. Um, one last thing I want to share is that we want to make healthy products, we want to make better products, and I think that making better is very important. But at the same time, I would say that I believe that it's not, we shouldn't be looking for the best product ever. We should be looking for the product that we can do, that we can have, that will be better. The product that we will like. Because we're talking about health. You want to eat healthier, you want to live longer. If you want to live longer, you actually also have to be very happy. And in my, pos my position, I can say that food is making me extremely happy. I'm also eating a lot of crap. Sorry to say that, but that's true. And um, well, when we want to make food better, there's many ways. That would be a combination of a lot of stuff, a lot of ingredients, a lot of new products, a lot of taste of colors and everything. And this is how I think we can change the future for the better. Well, thank you very much. Buonasera a tutti, è un gran piacere essere qui con voi. As you can tell, I'm not an Italian speaker, not yet, uh, but I'm working on it. I'm Alex Bugaliskis, and I have the honor of being the Canadian ambassador to Italy. But I'm also the permanent representative to the World Food Programme, to the uh, FAO, and to the International Fund in Agriculture and Development. And that's really important to, uh, to reference here, not only as a WFP a partner, as, as Canada is, uh, what you've been talking about today, and you will be uh, continuing in the next few days, is about how we meet that challenge of feeding 9 billion people and meeting our sustainable development goals of zero hunger. So I'm really actually already quite optimistic. I've heard a lot of uh, incredibly uh, interesting presentations. Today won't be one of those, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm going to be telling you about Canada. And I'm hoping by the time you leave here, you'll think, if you're a student or a researcher or a business person, that perhaps you should be thinking about going to Canada because we really are leading on innovation, food innovation. You all know that Canada is a big country the second largest in the world. That's not news. But, and that would perhaps explain why we're such a large agricultural producer. In fact, the fifth largest in the world. We produce a lot of food. And we produce it, the basic traditional commodities like grains and oil seeds, beef and pork, fish and seafood. But what you don't probably know is that we're also producing the new line of, of foods. Berries, we've got berries, gooseberries, cranberries, <laughs> blueberries, all kinds of great berries that are doing antioxidants, uh, 
maple syrup, 80% 80, 80 of maple syrup comes from Canada, and functional foods and nutraceuticals. But what you probably don't know is that we're also a really large importer of agriculture, the sixth largest importer of agriculture and agri-food products in the world. The reason I mention that is that we know both sides as both an exporter and an importer. And why do we import? Well, basically our climate. For many months of the year, we're unable to produce what we need to eat, and therefore we have to import it. So we're very particular about what we're importing. We also import, though, not out of necessity, but out of taste. Canada is a very diverse country. We have people from around the world. 20% of our population has been born abroad, 50% uh, in a major city like Toronto. And guess what? They like to eat what they ate at home, and we have to bring it in. And I'm so happy they do, because you can get the best global food uh, choices in Canada, because we have every kind of restaurant you can imagine. But the point I'm trying to make is that we realize that you need to both import and export to be very innovative. We are working really hard, in fact, to be able to remove the barriers to trade and to really foster innovation. You know, opening the doors and taking down the walls is really the only way to meet our future sustainability. So I wanted to talk to you about how we're being innovative in Canada and why. We've taken those challenges I've talked to you about, the climate, very difficult. A huge country, 10 million square kilometers. So imagine the transportation uh, difficulties. And despite being very big, only about 5% of our land is arable. We're hoping to expand that through science over the course of time, but at the moment we're still rather restricted. So you can look at those as challenges, or you can look at them as opportunities, and we like to look at them as opportunities. Our approach in Canada rests on four pillars. We use robust science, a very strong food safety culture, a very um, intense collaboration between academia, industry, and government, and significant investments in innovation. And you'll see how, taken together, they really lead to a framework that leads to innovation. As I said, we have natural strengths and abundant natural resources. 20% of the world's fresh waters in Canada, we're surrounded by three oceans. We have a diverse plant, animal, and marine life, and those are the building blocks for an array of super-quality agri-food products. But the Canadian government has also worked very hard to bring the private sector and the research community together and to provide the incentives that will encourage collaboration. And now, we're, they're really paying off. It's becoming incredibly vibrant. But let me talk about safety first. It always comes first. We've developed world-class standards. Canada's regulatory and food inspection systems are internationally recognized and based, as I said before, on robust science and evidence. These rigorous standards are really important, again, for a country that not only exports, but imports a lot of food, and Canadians trust in their system. But we're a leader in science, because our scientists and researchers talk to each other. What a concept. They talk. And they come, as I said, from very different backgrounds. So if you're looking for that diversity of thought, you can get it in one, st in one shop, and that's called Canada. We have a strong network of research facilities across the country, where innovators are focusing on developing the next generation of products and technologies. And we're making real significant investments. In 2000, we established a 2,000 research chairs across Canada. In 2017, we brought in an in innovative and skills plan. And this budget, this year, even as we're facing a bit of a debt, a little bit like Italy, <coughs> the Canadian government looked to the future and decided to make the single largest investment in investigator-led fundamental research, $1.2 in a strategic innovation fund. And then on top of that, we have a prime minister, Justin Trudeau, who's very visionary. And he announced a few months ago a billion-dollar investment to launch five highly specialized superclusters. We have now a superclusters in digital technology, advanced manufacturing, AI, ocean technologies, and one that will be of more interest to you here today, protein industries. These innovation clusters are aimed at accelerating innovation by making sure that research is really incentivized by demand, and it's industry-led and government-facilitated. So let me talk about the Canada, the Protein Industry Supercluster. It's an alliance of over 120 private sector companies working with academic institutions to develop the potential plant-based proteins from crops such as canola, grains, hemp, and flax. 
And the great part is that we're making a decided effort to ensure that we target leadership opportunities for women and for minorities in that process. So the theme of this session is pioneering new products. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what that development context is doing in bringing new products to the table. We have, as I said, over 700 companies from small startups to multinational enterprises. So we have Saputo's high protein milk to go sports drink. The Le Havre Natural Farms Haskep Berry Juice, and it was awarded in 2013 the World Juice Award winner. We have Leclerc's Preventia, they've got biscuits down here, but they're cookies, okay? They're really good, my favorite. Enhanced with red wine and inulin from chicory. Atoka cranberries and Acadian seed plants that incorporate unique seed plants into foods, nutraceuticals, and cosmetics. In the natural health food sector, we are using extract supplements from proteins and fibers from sources as varied as berries, red wine, herbs, and corn. And on the omega-3 front and other essential fatty acids, we're taking them from marine and plant sources. That includes, uh, includes canola, hemp, flaxseed, sea buckthorn, algae. We'll take it from anything. Fiber from soy and from chia, fenugreek, oats, barley, and pulses. Antioxidants from blueberries, cranberries, and Saskatoon berries. And protein, of course, from milk, eggs, soy, and pulses. So let me conclude by talking about partnerships. It's really important globally, but because I'm in Italy, I'll talk about the great cooperation between Canada and Italy in a sector that's so important to both of our countries. Great Italian companies are investing in Canada because they see it as a platform not only to our market, but to the larger North American market of about 500 million consumers. Ferrero, Griesenbahn are about two examples of Italian companies now coming to Canada. And next year, Italy will open its doors in Toronto and provide an incredible platform to really raise the interest and uh, consume consumption of Italian food products. If you're an Italian researcher, you may have benefited from the Canada Italy Innovation Award. For over the last five years, we've been giving out uh, researcher, awards to researchers from Italy to come to Canada with the research to work in an uh, incubator and to be able to commercialize their, uh, their new ideas and uh, startups. And most importantly, our secret weapon is a team of great, great trade commissioners, all of whom are women here in Milan. We've got Anna and Leonella and uh, Nicoletta, and they're right at G12 booth, so be please come by if you're interested in hearing more about Canada or how you might bring your products to Canada. And if you're... Uh, um, I wanted to just talk, I had an opportunity to walk around a little bit earlier today. We have some great Canadian companies here. Uh, we have Rainmaker, who is bringing irrigation uh, capacity to uh, countries like Sudan. We have uh, Prometheon, who is providing new apps to make it cool to be a farmer. And I was really happy to hear one of the early uh, Tina innovators talk about his dream to be a farmer. We have uh, NutriTower. Yeah, this, this thing is a... Um, uh, an instrument that will allow you to grow your own plants at home, a little bit like the Bosco uh, Verticale, but it's a little smaller, okay? It can fit actually in your apartment. And uh, Montel, who's um, providing uh, real efforts to be able to um, provide storage in greenhouses. So I'm learning a lot here today. I hope you feel, as I do, incredibly optimistic, really, about the future. Um, not only am I decided now to become a vegetarian because it will taste good, um, but the, ab the ability to actually produce what we will need to feed the world is here. I see it in all of your faces today. So thank you very much. There's nothing more important than what you're doing today to feeding the world and feeding it well. Grazie mille. Eh? Thank you. This session turns out to be around one thing, protein. Really makes me happy, really makes me happy. Can I have the pointer? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if it's not clear to you already, we are living in the era of the protein paradox. Let me explain. I get this crucial building block for my body, proteins, out of plant sources and animal sources. I was grown up with abundant amounts of meat and cheese and milk. And when I was reaching the age of 30, I ended up about 25 kilograms heavier than I am now and a cholesterol level 
which went out of the roof. It started, I started thinking, what's happening here? Because I grew up with the idea that meat and dairy was a sign of luxury and health. Ladies and gentlemen, over the past 60 years, and these are the numbers for the European Union, the consumption pattern has totally changed. In the 60s, about 50% of our proteins were plant-based, 50% were animal-based. Nowadays, it's about 65 to 70% animal-based and only 30-35% plant-based. We have created this meat mountain. We enjoyed the view for just a few years, but now we're up there, we can see a little bit further. And we see that it's not so healthy and it's not so sustainable. Hence, the protein paradox. But moving back from that mountain is not so easy. And we, our planet, and I myself, I don't have another 60 years to do so. I want to do it in 10 years, going back again to that more healthy balance of 50-50. And how can we do so? How can we do that? I don't want to wait for governments to take action with policy. No, I'm convinced that we need people that make plant protein personal. I dare to say that I'm one of them. I have my own personal reasons, as stated before. And about 15 or 10 years ago, I said, OK, I am going to create a meat successor, the next generation meat. And I called it plant meat. Not a burger or a sausage, but the original thing, the chicken breast, a pork filet. And I decided not to create a brand around it because I believe in pluriformity. I don't believe in one brand or one product making the difference. So I started looking for other people who are the same way motivated as me to make the difference. And I ended up with this guy. His name is Jaap. He approached me and he said, Jeroen, I have this concept, it's called the vegetarian butcher. I said, what? He said, the vegetarian butcher. And he said, well, I have this concept, but I don't have a product. I said, okay, I can help you. You can hate him or you love him, but he is able to reach out to a certain group of people with fully plant-based products, based on the ones that I developed and created. And like that, I found many others in other countries. And you know what? We need these plant protein cowboys because they can show that it really works. Because just by introducing great products with our, which are healthy for our body and which are healthy for our planet, that doesn't create a sustainable change. Besides healthy people and a healthy planet, we need, we need healthy businesses profitable businesses. You may take that literally. And there are fortunately more and more investors now that see the opportunities like new crop capital. And last year in the Netherlands, the first green protein fund was founded, participating only in companies with propositions in the plant protein business. And they in turn set banks in motion the Rabobank, the biggest bank in the Netherlands, released this report only a few months ago, warning the meat industry that they should watch out. And I'm quite sure that they really have to watch out. And it's much more than just their growth that these companies in the plant protein business will steal. And the ING Bank says, is wondering, will the Europeans change their diet? Hell yeah, they will. They already are. And I dare to say so, because there's a whole new generation also of entrepreneurs and companies which are standing up. 
my apologies for the misprint here, but in the Netherlands alone, there are 186 companies that are claiming their share in the plant protein chain. 168. And they are teaming up. They are clustering. It's a sign that the transition is really happening. And those small companies, many will not reach the final finish, but some of them will. Recognize, recognize the picture? When companies like Kerry really start to see the light and go from Nice to Moss, it's a big and impressive sign. It's a sign, ladies and gentlemen, that the protein game is changing and it's changing really fast. And it's not just the usual suspects that are teaming up. It's the big retailers. This is uh, an example in the Netherlands, the Green Protein Alliance, where also Albert Heijn, large retailer, and Unilever are teaming up and making it easy for everybody, more easy again, to consume delicious plant protein products. The main question is, does it work? Well, these are the numbers, some of the trends of the retail sales in the Netherlands of plant protein foods. And since this Green Protein Alliance was established, we see an average annual growth of about 5%. And at the same time, we see that the sales, the retail sales of meat and dairy cheese is going down. I have to admi admit that the scales on this chart are not yet the same. They, ch they, still cha they still vary an order of magnitude, about two. But it's a beginning, it's a beginning. There's something changing. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm a marathon runner. I run long distances and I have the talent to accelerate along the marathon. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just, I have just reached the five kilometer mark. This is just the beginning. I want more. And that's also why, together with the Food Valley in Wageningen, we created the protein cluster to make sure that retailers all over the world match up with all these great entrepreneurs with all their plant green protein products. And I kindly invite you to join me and many others during the Food Valley Protein Summit of the Future on October 10th in Ede in the Netherlands. So that you can also claim your share of this fast growing market. It's been announced, announced for, uh, for, for decades, but ladies and gentlemen, the plant protein prophecy is unfolding. And I invite you, make sure that you're a part of it. Thank you very much. Five hundred years ago, Leonardo da Vinci wrote, and this is paraphrasing, that human reasoning could never devise an invention as beautiful, simple, or pure as that of nature, because in her inventions, nothing is lacking and nothing is unnecessary. Now, I doubt da Vinci was talking about Abby's Better Products when he said this. However, I was amazed when I read the quote about how accurately it describes what we at Abby's Better are all about. When I was a teen, I wanted to be fit, so I paid attention to my f nutrition and physical activity. I was at my house and I was hungry. I was 15 years old, it was the summer of 2015, but there were no healthy snacks available to me. All I had were some nuts, natural sweeteners, coconut oil, and a food processor. And that's when the Abby's Better brand was created and I created our nut butters, using what Da Vinci would describe as beautiful, simple ingredients. As I continued to experiment, I developed five of our nut butter flavors using nature's purest ingredients with zero additives or preservatives. As I shared it with friends and family, I realized it was something special. And that's what began our journey to a family business and what's brought me in front of you today. 
Early in the evolution of the Abby's Better Clean Label Snack brand, there were some standards that I wanted all of our products to meet. I wanted them to be non-GMO, gluten-free, plant-based, have zero artificial sweeteners, and make sure that we only use whole delicious foods. These standards align with what people want. More and more studies are showing that people want to know where their food comes from, how it's grown, and how it's going to affect their health. There are so many countries like my own where obesity, diabetes, and heart disease is epidemic. Gen Xers, millennials, my generation, and even baby boomers are now demanding that foods enhance their quality of life. Three years ago, I had no idea what I was doing or what would come of the products that I created. But since then, I've not only been motivated to keep going, but to go further than I ever thought was possible. I want my experience of creating the Abby's Better Clean, Lac uh, Clean Snack brand to encourage young people, especially young women of my generation, to dream big and believe that they can make a difference. I want to inform people about nutrition and how it can affect their goals and their overall health. And I want to create affordable and available snacks to people who might not otherwise have access to them. But for the Abby's Butter brand to do this and all the other incredible companies out there, we need the support of those who have come before us. You have valuable financial and technical resources to help us shape the food industry of the 21st century. I'd like to invite all of you guys to visit the Abby's Better booth and speak with us further about our vision for the future and see if it even aligns with your own. I believe in our product and our path. And from what Da Vinci said 500 years ago, I think he would have believed in us too. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to talk about uh, the basis of food, farming. I'm the founder of Acacias for All, which is a social enterprise. And um, I'm what, we call, what I call a dream strategist. I believe that by dreaming, we can change the world, but we need to have a strategy to make things done. So, <coughs> in 2012, I created Acacias for All, <coughs> Sorry. which is a social enterprise fighting desertification, poverty, and gender inequalities. And as you know, every social enterprise starts with a personal story. Mine is very simple. I was born in Paris, and when I was nine, I discovered my grandparents' country, Tunisia, and I loved it because I was harvesting every summer almonds and picking my own vegetables in the garden. And I enjoyed every year going back in Tunisia, in my grandparents' houses, farming. <clears throat> the problem is, 20 years later, my own daughter, who is now four, she will not have the same chance. Because in Tunisia, 75% of the land will be desertified by 2030 in areas which are arid, where there is up to 25% of unemployment. And if you don't know that, in Tunisia, like in many countries, 80% of women farmers are not paid, even if they are the ones who are making the food we eat. So I tried to find a solution. And we started by creating local Tunisian ambassadors, people who believe that we can fight desertification by planting trees while creating good foods. And we did that through uh, training uh, people to permaculture, a new way of doing farming a way that is natural, that is just imitating nature. We don't use any chemical, we don't use anything innovative in a scientific way. We just do what nature has been done for millennia. We replicate it. What we do is forest gardens, so we just use crops that don't need a lot of water in places where there is no water. And we created an app so we got, were able, in the last two years, to plant 300,000 trees uh, by ourselves, just uh, making people aware that planting trees will help us. Why it will help us? Because in Tunisia, Tunisia is not an isolated case. 70% uh, of the lands in the world are touched by desertification and climate change issues in planting trees, but not any kind of trees. But cr the trees we plant, it's uh, acacia trees, and one of it 
is called Moringa. And you probably heard about it because you're all from the food innovation sector. So we grow Moringa in arid areas with a little, very little amount of water in a very li natural way. Now, Moringa is what we call the superfood. It's full of proteins, vitamins, etc. And it's a very powerful antioxidant. There is 48 antioxidants in Moringa leaves. So what we do is quite simple. We do ecological and ethical value chain for climate justice. We try to solve climate issues by planting trees and setting sustainable value chain to create jobs for women farmers in Tunisia and we hope one day in other countries in Africa. Our plantation model is based on permaculture. So we plant moringa and all the crops all together so we can restore the soils while creating revenues. We also launched an app so people can plant anywhere from anywhere in Tunisia, trees with us, and contribute to our, to our activities because our aim is to plant one million trees by the end of this year. Moringa is a big market. It's a four billion dollar market. And our aim is to just focus on one percent of this market, of this market producing organic fair trade certified Moringa in order to create a lot of jobs and planting more trees. Because 70% of you and me and European consumers want healthy organic foods. Our products are, like other companies here, good for health and good for the planet. Every time we buy our products, we plant more trees, we create more jobs. It's very easy. We do tea, Moringa tea, or Moringa powder, Moringa boosters, Moringa chocolate, and it helps us plant more trees. Every time we plant a tree, uh, we, we plant, uh, for each women, woman we work with, we plant around 3,000 trees. And it helps each woman gain from the first year of plantation $1,000 and it go up to $6,000 by the fifth year. It's a lot of money for this woman. And it's an opportunity to create jobs, fair, sustainable jobs. And in the same way, to offer us, you, customers, consumers, uh, healthy products. So, of course, I'm not alone. I am a dreamer, as I told you. And uh, when I started, I was very naive. I thought like, okay, we are just going to plant trees and we're going to save the world. But then I realized that maybe I will, I will need some scientists with me. So now in the team, we have an agronomist and he's a specialized in, in uh, protein-based food. And also we have a... Uh, and um, Nora, and she has been working on local seeds. And why I'm talking about local seeds? Because today we are talking about innovation. What I want to make, to, to make you aware of is that in innovation, we should not just go too far. We, just try to f we sh should just try to focus on very little basic things. Today, we are, we, uh, our local seeds are disappearing all over the world. And at the same time, we see that there is a lot of food issues. But we know that local seeds and local plants are absolutely adapted to, clim to, to, climate, to the climate issues. So I just offer you this idea. Let's focus on innovation. Let's focus on innovation, yes. <coughs> but creating a link between farmers, between communities who are trying to save their lands, trying to save their local traditions, local foods, local seeds, with uh, innovation, with science. Because science without uh, traditions will just go in something that is not first, maybe not ethical. And just following traditions will not get us very far. But all together, we can really make a change. Many people talked about our initiative, One Million Trees for Tunisia, and we hope, I hope that it can at least um, inspire some other people to do the same. Because, whoops, yes, because uh, it is very simple to change the world. Actually, for us, we just ask you something. Drink our Moringa tea and let us plant your tree. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Crisp. I'm a co-founder and the CEO of Benson Hill Biosystems. 
Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about modernization of our food system and specifically how we can use genomics to accomplish that. Uh, so in my background, I've spent the bulk of my career in venture capital and uh, in venture capital investing in life sciences. One of the things that impacted me and actually um, catalyzed my joining the agriculture and food community was the realization that food and agriculture were not using the types of tools and technologies that we globally have been employing for a long time in the human health space. And I'll talk a little bit about that in some more detail today. I don't think anybody in this room needs to hear this again, but I'll, I'll just at a high level say, consumers want more. And the traditional system, while it served a terrific purpose to produce at scale cheap calories, that system is not going to take us where we need to go. What we see and what excites us is a community of innovators that's rapidly emerging to help address some of the global challenges. We're talking about companies focused on, as you've heard multiple times today, protein, alternative protein. We're also seeing companies that are focused on ancient grains, niche and specialty crops, and how to tap into those for extremely dense nutritional value, and also indoor agriculture, which is a phenomenon that just a few years ago, many of us would not have looked to as a system or an outlet for food system improvement. This sets the stage for biology. When we talk about natural plant diversity, we at Benson Hill believe that the natural diversity that already exists in, in, in plants is probably the most valuable sing single underutilized resource globally. 30,000 plant species exist on this planet and they're edible. Our food system today relies on a tiny fraction of that, about 30, and only a handful have received any real focused genomics innovation. In fact, the majority of our calories come from only those five. Again, to emphasize, 99.9% .9 of what we consume is derived from less than 0.1% of the natural genetic diversity of plants. Plants are complex. I like to say they're like more complex than the human genome, in large part because they don't have these two things to run away from the elements. There, over time, has evolved some remarkable capabilities. Defense mechanisms for the environment, yes, but capabilities that can be tapped for human good as well. So why have we not done that? Because innovation using genomics in crops is hard. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of money. And it takes a lot of infrastructure. At least, that's the way it used to be. On the left there, you see five multinational companies over the last 25 years constitute 80% of the global R&D investment in crops. That's including private sector dollars and public sector dollars. Five companies. The result of that is a focus on yield. Yield is important. Yield is what gave us and gives us cheap calories. But it's time that this change. What Benson Hill was founded on doing is creating a platform that allows us to fundamentally alter those rules. To create not one company or a few companies that's concentrated their investment on too few crops, but a community of companies that's truly empowered to innovate. Why can we do this now and we couldn't do it before? The answer is a convergence of technology as we've seen revolutionizing vertical after vertical 
in our economy the convergence of artificial intelligence, sensors and phenotyping technology, sequencing, genotyping, machine learning, big data. The convergence of all of these is the reason why I, someone who didn't come from agriculture, who didn't grow up on a farm, became extremely passionate about getting into the food and ag space and doing something important. Crop OS, which we shortened from Crop Operating System, is a technology platform that allows us to look holistically at the total genetic diversity of plants and to deploy that asset towards solving major project, product and project challenges. It allows us to get to market much faster and for much less cost. One of the tools that we have built from this crop operating system is called Breed. It's a cloud-based user interface that allows any breeder or any researcher or technician for that matter, anywhere in the world with an internet connection, to access the same type of AI that the biggest multinational companies have, that allow them for any crop to use genomics and data and understand the genetic population of what they have and how to breed it to most efficiently create value, to create plants, niche crops, crops on a very few acres or very large acres, but nonetheless differentiated crops that provide oftentimes higher nutrition density, more resiliency in the face of climate change, more micronutrient content, drought tolerance, yield. All of these things can be levered and, and targeted towards a computational breeding platform like this. Another really powerful technology that many of you have heard of is called genome editing. And genome editing is, for all intents and purposes, revolutionizing the way that we think about genomics and human health. Last year, one of the top innovations globally was a CRISPR-enabled therapy that has begun to actually save lives. Genome editing is the ability to use very precise changes in a plant genome and essentially accelerate more dramatically that breeding process we talked about a minute ago. So unlike GMOs, we can actually use gene editing to leverage the genetic diversity of plants that already exist within that species and not lend from other species. Edit, also powered by CropOS, is a system that merges what we like to call the wetware and the dryware. The dryware, or the computational system, allows us to predict precisely where and how to make these genetic tweaks or improvements. Again, lending from the genetic diversity that already exists within that plant genome. And then the wetware is the chemistry. It's the CRISPR technology that allows you to actually go in and very precisely affect those changes. Benson Hill's the only company that's taken these two assets, these two technologies, capabilities, and put them together and offered them to the market. It's for us about empowering innovators and the partners that we're doing with are more often than not the smallest, small to medium-sized companies with not the largest R&D budgets or academics who are desiring to leverage this type of capability and technology. What does that equal? At the end of the day, as I mentioned before, you use a tool like Breed and you get two, two times the genetic gain in about two-thirds the time. That top uh, bar there, highlighting how long it takes to develop a new plant variety is in large part why we have not seen more innovation in more crops. Skipping down to edit, you can go even faster using genome editing technology. But the bottom line here is it takes for the first time, historically, plant genomics innovation and makes it accessible to food system innovators. Again, historically, we focused on the farmer. 
By focusing on or empowering food system innovators, we actually can begin to look at the totality of the system. We can continue to serve farmers. We can continue to enhance profitability. We can continue to focus on performance through traits like photosynthetic efficiency, which is one area that Benson Hill has spent a tremendous amount of resources trying to understand, creating also crops that are more climate resilient, more sustainable generally, using water use efficiency or nitrogen use of this efficiency and applying less of these to the, uh, to, the, to the plants, to the crops. But we can also focus on consumer-centric traits, nutrition quality, sensory quality, differentiating with more healthy and more nutritious foods, foods that taste good, that have better texture and sensory qualities. And some of those examples are here. Again, the merge of machine learning and artificial intelligence with genome editing precision is enabling these types of products which are already in development or being or approaching market or are in development approaching market. A healthier, better tasting lettuce with a higher micronutrient density. More sustainable, more, photos, more, more photosynthetically efficient corn. Again, photosynthesis is a remarkably inefficient process, actually. We can, using more atmospheric carbon, capture that and translate it into more output for a grower, and not just corn, but any crop, by enhancing this system and using less water and less fertilizer. Another one on its way to market now is a higher nutrition oil, a high oleic oil and soybean. And we hear this all the time, that it's not just soybean, but there's dozens of additional crops, legumes and pulses, that are on high demand, in large part because of food system innovators, a couple of whom you've heard from today. They want higher quality, more diverse sources for their ingredients, and ultimately to have cleaner labels and differentiated food products. Another one that you haven't heard about today, but I'm excited about, is chocolate. More resilient cacao plants. Mars announced that they have partnered with UC Berkeley and are using CRISPR gene editing technology to make more, resist more resilient cacao plants to prevent deforestation in the highlands of Africa where it grows its crops. We all know that food waste is a major issue. There are companies like Simplot Plant Sciences that are focused on non-browning potatoes, and there are other companies focused on non-browning approaches using genome editing. So this is an example of what's to come. We at Benson Hill are very dedicated to developing some of those products ourselves, but more importantly, and most impactfully, to empowering innovators throughout the entire value chain, no matter what size, to leverage these types of technologies and tools and capabilities and to develop better, more sustainable, more resilient, healthy products that we all can enjoy. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon. Great part of today's speeches has been focused on uh, plant-based protein, green proteins. I am Enrico Farina, and I am a marketing director of uh, a company who makes uh, cured meat. <laughs> Maybe I am troubled today. I am truly convinced that my position is not opposite to Seth, Dan, Thomas, Jerwin is right. Uh, I think it's complementary, and I hope uh, at the end of my speech uh, you'll be too. First of all, I want to tell you I feel so lucky and proud to be a part of uh, a world uh, that is done with uh, in uh, uh, quality, uh, excellence, different varieties due to historical reasons and geographical differences. The Italian food. Before we have seen uh, one slide in which uh, we see that, that Italian people uh, uh, reached the second position in uh, life expe expectation. 
And uh, I think uh, part of this reason is, uh, is food, Italian food, I Italian way of eating. Uh, Italian food uh, has reached, has had uh, obtained 272 recognition in uh, PDO and PGI uh, recognition, that is a European uh, uh, seal, and it's uh, more than 25% of the total uh, of the European products who has this recognition. 40 of them are Italian salumi. I will talk to you about uh, a market worth uh, 7.9 billion euro for 1.1 million tons, where exported products account for 18% of the total production. It takes its origin, this product, this market, it is deeply rooted in history. From the days of ancient Rome, when meat was commonly preserved by salted it, the name salumi derives from the medieval Latin salumen, that means made with salt. To this very day, a good part of Italian salumi cannot exist without some specific elements, namely meat, mainly pork, but not only pork, salt and other ingredients that are, uh, are depending on the type of cured meat. Clearly, cured meats, which has always been part of the diet of the Italians and for some time now uh, are part of the diet of millions of consumers around the world can be a problem when it comes to well-being because of the fat and salt content and because of the use of preservatives such as nitrites and nitrates. So my company in, uh, in the autumn on, of uh, 2017, asked the Eometra Monterosa Market Research Agency for a quality quantitative analysis that could help understand how people perceive this sector. And uh, the main aim was to understand the socio cultural trends and which segments of population are prepared to accept innovations, to identify a ranking scale of values rega regarding well being. The survey included over 1,800 participants identified among, among uh, consumers of uh, cured meats and uh, representing the entire population, the entire universe of Italian population. The first piece of uh, evidence showed that people who eat meats are uh, evolved individuals with a varied diet who do not turn their nose up at vegan and vegetarian products. It is surprising to see how much the consumers of cured meats care for their health. It's also interesting uh, to, for us to discover that nutrition is considered related to well-being. We are above the national average. The simplistic idea that people who eat cured meats are more likely to transgress or indulgence does not, does not seem so well-founded after all. Our journey in the search of uh, uh, these uh, this, uh, important points regarding well-being goes through a direct question. How interested are you in the fact that the packaged cured meats you buy have the characteristics listed on the packet? So, Antibiotic-free and controls on the supply chain are the most frequently mentioned items with uh, uh, the origin of the meat and uh, the animal welfare. These are the most important items for Italian people. But when we talk of well-being, we enter in an, uh, an extremely complex universe made of subject perception and composed of values and concepts that are more or less directly relevant and related to well-being itself. Topics such as physical exercise or care for the body are at the same level and near with the topics like zero kilometers and animal welfare. Uh, at this point, uh, our project evolved through a, a, in a, a process of skimming off a good part of these items. 
we decided to, to arrive uh, only to uh, a few number, a little number of items that could, uh, could give uh, us uh, the real entity of the new product for uh, cured meats. And uh, the items for us were transparency, healthy, good, and so pure. Let's talk uh, talking about transparency. Why transparent? Because as producer of cured meats, we decided we wanted to access to controls over the entire production from farms that comply with animal welfare standards to meat processing, which take place in our production units. Transparent because we have decided to be completely transparent when we state our recipes. There is no room for lack or clarity or interpretation doubts, what I'm referring to. There are a lot of companies who use slogans, who use uh, payoff that are very dangerous for us and for our consumers. I mean, we will not claim zero GMO among the ingredients when the ingredients is only 0.5 of the total product. I mean, we will not claim we use no artificial or chemical preservatives and I have replaced them with preservatives of natural origin when uh, nitrate and nitrate, nitrates are at the same level. Healthy. Why? Because this new project includes products made with meat from farms where animals are antibiotic free from birth, where no growth promoters are used, and where animals have an exclu exclusively vegetarian diet. Healthy because the meat is processed using only a few ingredients. The label is very clean. We keep preservatives to an absolute minimum. So, this is our new product, Puro, Puro Beret, pure me Puro means pure, and uh, it is uh, antibiotic free from birth, using the maximum respect for animal welfare, 100% controlled supply chain, and 100% uh, clean recipe. This is only the first step for us. Uh, our uh, industry is related to an, an, an history that, is, uh, that takes uh, far from, uh, from here. If you look at our logo, uh, we have 1812, more than 200 uh, uh, years of history. And uh, uh, a good part of Italian companies in this sector have a long history. It's very difficult to, to make changes, to to have research and de development in this, in this market, but it is necessary. We are waiting for uh, the new release of the new guidelines for nutrition that will be published by CREA, Italian Council for Research in Agriculture, that, uh, that is a government agency for the ag agriculture. And uh, it will contains these recommendations, balancing nutrients with exercise, more fruit and vegetables, whole cereals and pulses, plenty of water, reduction and careful selection of fats, reduction of foods with added sugars, reduction of salt intake. And uh, salami, what is the cured meat future? One of the concepts that seems to emerge from the new guidelines is that there is no good food or bad food, just good or bad diets. Processed meats will be considered semi-luxury items to be eaten occasionally. We, are, we have the consciousness of this. So, it will be up to consumers to include them in a balanced diet but at the same level, it's up to the producer to provide increasingly safe, healthy and transparent foods 
so consumers can make an informed choice and eat responsibly in a good diet. Thank you.